uh, RIT University has four community colleges in the university level in Australia and the US, uh, published uh, a few books, I believe, and contributed book chapters to several edited books. Um, he is a freelance writer for the Greek American newspaper, The National Herald, um, which is based in New York. Um, Terry is going to speak to us today about the last days of Pontus, um, 1919 to um, 1922. Um, Terry, my friend is Thank you, uh, Lundros, for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Deg and return to Natalia for this event. It is a day of reflection, a, a solemn day. My talk will focus, it will be an overview. If I was to give you the, the full story, I would keep you here for hours. So I'll, I'll keep it simple to about 20 minutes, maybe 25 at, at the max. It will be an overview. I will focus on the Greeks of uh, Pontos. Pontos is a geographical region along the, uh, along the Black Sea coast of, of what is now modern day Turkey. My talk will bring up issues of diplomacy, involvement of uh, great powers, deportations and uh, massacres. And against the background of the Greco-Turkish War of 1919 to 22, because the Pontian issue must be placed within that context as well. At the end of that conflict in September 1922, when the Greek army was routed and left Asia Minor forever, there began the expulsion of the Greek populations from Smyrna and from Pontos. And that also involved a compulsory exchange of populations between Greece and Turkey, which was embodied in a convention as part of the Luzon Treaty, which was signed on July 24, 1923. I will try to keep it in a chronological order and also intertwine it with some of the issues that I've raised in, in my introduction. Let's start off with 1919. Why is 1919 so important? Well, it is an important year. It was the year where all the victorious powers of World War I gathered in Paris to impose their peace treaties and terms on the vanquished. By the vanquished, I mean the central powers, Imperial Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, and of course, the Ottoman Empire. For us, the Ottoman Empire is the key. When it came to the Greek issue, Eleutherus Venizelos, the Greek Prime Minister, delivered Greece's territorial claims at the conference in early February 1919. And he listed, he listed a whole, you know, the Smyrna, the, uh, the Dodecanese Islands, Cyprus, etc. But in terms of uh, Pontos, he said that it was better for the Greek Pontians to align themselves with, with the Armenians. Because at that stage too, the Armenians wanted to establish their own independent state. They already had a state, but they wanted to formalise in a peace treaty. Uh, um, just after Venizelos had uh, delivered his uh, territorial claims, there was a Pontian de delegation in Paris that outlined, firstly, a independent Pontian state and and of course there were many uh, Greeks who fled from Pontus in World War One because of Turkish reprisals, deportations and massacres and they wanted these people to return back to this in independent republic. But Venizelos told the Pontians, look guys, your best bet is to line up with the Armenians. And, and that's where it stayed. Now we fast forward to 1920, early 1920. The actual peace treaty between Turkey was actually delayed. And the reason why it was delayed was because President Woodrow Wilson of the United States wanted to get the United States to accept the, the mandate for Armenia 
and for all of Anatolia. But the US Congress of the time wanted a policy of non-involvement in the affairs of the old world. They wanted exclusion from, from the affairs of Europe. So in the end, the, the Allied powers gathered in London in, in February, March 1920 to start hammering out a peace treaty for, for Turkey. And, and, they, and they made headway and to reconfirm those uh, agreements, uh, February, March 1920, it was held at San Remo. And that laid the grounds for the Treaty of Severus, which was signed on August 10, 1920. And as a point of interest, the Australian government signed that document. The Australian High Commissioner, Andrew Fisher, signed that on behalf of the Commonwealth in in Severus, which is a town just outside of Paris. Around that time, during the March discussions in London, that the Pontians actually sent a six-page memorandum outlining why they wanted their independence and they wanted their, the support of the Allies. But unfortunately, the Allied powers, Britain, France, Italy, were not really interested. They had bigger fish to fry. They had their own agendas in Asia Minor. They wanted to parcel out spheres of direct and indirect economic zones. And that was actually reflected in the tripartite agreement, which was a separate agreement to the Treaty of, uh, of Severus. In the meantime, the Pontians had, had returned back from Russia and from other regions where, where they may have suffered. And at that time, things were, weren't going too bad for them. <coughs> but then, towards the end of 1920, the small Armenian Republic, which, which uh, like, uh, was being attacked by the Russian Bolsheviks and by the Turkish nationalists led by Mustafa Kemal, later known as Ataturk. And that... Little Republic was actually snuffed out, that atrocities were committed by, by the Turkish nationalists and eventually became a Soviet uh, Republic. It wasn't until 1991 that Armenia became an independent state as it is now. And by the way, there is a genocide taking place right now in Azerbaijan in the, uh, in the region known as Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh, perpetrated by by the Azeri government. <coughs> so, so it's around from, from 1920 right through to 1922, there was this scoundrel by the name of Topal Osman Aga. He and his merry men of uh, cutthroats committed genocide under the length and breadth of, of the region of Pontos. They would raid Pontian villages, plunder them, rob them, burn them, kill the people, and sometimes take the women in, into Turkish uh, harems. To make matters worse, the Greek government d decided to shell uh, d towns along the Black Sea in June, July 1921. And the reason why they, that they did that action was because the Bolsheviks had formed a, an alliance and were supplying armaments to the Turkish nationalists. So in, in an act of war, the, the Greek Navy was within its rights to shell these uh, towns where they believed there were uh, munitions and so on. So the Turks... So the Kemalists actually used that as an excuse to begin the deportation of men, women and children from the coastal regions of the Black Sea or the Pontus region. Many of these people were, were deported en masse and they suffered terribly. They, they were starved, they were beaten, 
and they were left to die. And as I said again, I will repeat it, that the Palos man kept, kept hurried up the situation. As the Greek army in, the, in July, August 1921 had, a, had achieved a series of military victories and the prize was Angora or what is now known as Ankara, the, the Turkish capital of today. So, so the Greek army was full ahead to, to conquer Ankara, but it failed. It was, it was sort of like counter, counter-attack, counter, counter-attack. And so, so finally the Greek army was actually pushed back and the Turks or the Camelus saved their capital from being occupied by, by the Greeks. In the meantime, in Pontus, it was alleged that there was a Pontian secret group that had been formed to overthrow the, uh, the, the, the uh, Camalus government. And they claimed that, that they found maps and documents and so on. And that was all really a lie. It was designed to get rid of the Greeks in that region. And they also invented what was called the Courts of Independence or the Independence Tribunals. They arrested, well the, well, the Turks arrested all the intelligentsia, you know, your bankers, your teachers, your scientists and, what, uh, and business people and accused them of false crimes and many of them were, were actually executed. And there are quite a number of State Department documents where they list the names of these unfortunate souls. The then, Arcti the then acting Greek Patriarch appealed to the League of Nations for them to intervene and to try to do something for, for the Pontian Greeks. But unfortunately, the, the League of Nations said, well, we have no army and we don't have the, the financial resources. So that was another letdown. However, there was this very brave American Senator, William King of Utah, who actually had the fortitude to make a long speech, and it's available online. So I think it's around 30 pages in length, thereabouts. And, and he talked about that we need to do something for, for these people. They are being butchered. That they need to be saved. They even had meetings. The, the Greeks in the United States had meetings to try to encourage the, the president of the time, Warren Harding, to, to get off his uh, backside and do something for these people. Nothing was done. So Senator King introduces uh, a, a House resolution in the early part of 1922 encouraging the, the United States government along with the European powers to do something for these people. But again, the great powers were not really interested in getting involved in another war in that part of the world. They were more interested in coming to terms with Mustafa Kemal because when, when the Greek army had failed to occupy Ankara, it signalled to the West it was time now to look to do business with, with the Turks rather than with the Greeks. To, to, to complicate things further, in May of 1922, these two American Near East relief workers, Dr. Mark Ward and Mr. Frank Yoel, appear all of a sudden in Constantinople and they go straight to the British High Commission and, and they report to, to Sir Horace Rumbold, the British High Commissioner, we have seen with our own eyes deportations of men, women and children from, from villages and towns or, uh, from the Black Sea. 
and we've seen them where they've been stationed in this town and then they moved off to another town, another city or whatever. And uh, Dr. Mark Ward actually kept a diary and he recorded roughly that the numbers of people that, that, that were being deported. And they actually witnessed carcasses of dead bodies uh, along the road. Unfortunately, it, it is really quite strange that the American High Commissioner, Admiral Mark Bristol, was quite angered that his two Americans, Ward and Yoel, went to the British rather than to him. And the reason why they didn't go to uh, uh, Bristol was because he was known for his pro-Turkish sympathies. And when he sent uh, dispatches to his masters in Washington, D.C., he, he fudged the record. Around that time, too, in the middle of May 1922, this issue of Mark and Ward was discussed in the British House of Commons. And then all of a sudden, we see this decision to hold an international commission of inquiry to go into Pontos to verify the information of Ward and Yoa. But unfortunately, that international commission of, of uh, allied officers never took place. So then the scheme was then moved from the allies to bring in the International Committee of the Red Cross, which was viewed as a neutral organisation. And that uh, mission went nowhere again. In, in June 1922, the Greek army commences shelling again of uh, coastal fortifications on the Black Sea. But the Turks uh, protested that it was, uh, that the Greeks' action was wrong. And, and, and in the meantime, they used that again as an excuse to commence further deportations. Come September 1922, the, the Greek army lost the war. It evacuated. And, and of course, as the Greek army was retreating, towards Smyrna, or Izmir as it's now known, there were thousands of, of refugees following them. And a lot of them ended up uh, on the Smyrna harbour seeking refuge. Some survived, others died. Now, how do the Pontians fit into all this? Well, at the end of the Greek-Turkish War, uh, many of the Greeks had already fled from, you know, from the western littoral uh, of Asia Minor. But the Greeks who, who were in, in Pontos were eventually found their way through, through the Anatolian desert in the east. They ended, ended up on the southeast coast of Turkey. Some w went to Syria. And eventually these, uh, these individuals were, were picked up by by Allied ships, British, American, or whatever. Uh, many of them went to uh, to the Greek islands. Some ended up in um, in Piraeus, and then on to refugee camps. But uh, also, too, I'd like to point out is that the Saloniki became a very major centre uh, of the Greeks from Asia Minor uh, as refugees. Finally, in, in, as I said, uh, July 1923, the peace treaty was signed between, between the Turkey of Mustafa Kemal and the Allies and Greece, and it also included a compulsory exchange of populations. Now, there were Greeks still in Turkey in 1923. By, I'd say, around the middle of 1924, whatever Greeks remained in Pontos and other parts of Asia Minor at all left. So basically, as uh, Lambrov said earlier, uh, Turkey was, was viewed as Turkey for the Turks. So I'd like to, to conclude by saying is that history repeats itself.
and the lessons of history are never learned. And if we don't heed those lessons, we shall repeat them again and again and again. And this is why I take great interest in education. And I'm very saddened to, today when I see history not viewed as a very sexy subject, subject which it deserves, because history tells us where we've come from, who we are, what the present is. I mean, history cannot predict the future, but it can give us some pointers as to where we may go. So on that note, I'd like to conclude my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Terry. Now, Terry is... Um agreed to um, make some time available for any questions. So, um, is there anyone in the audience that would like to ask a question? Yeah. Thanks, Terry. Thanks for the um, very instructive talk. Thanks for the next item to include. Terry, um, have you any idea of sort of how many Greeks, Armenians, Assyrians um, lost their lives in? in in this genocide around this time? Or? Well, according to, to the Armenians, the Armenians say one and a half million, okay? Of, of just Armenians? Or? Yeah, um, of Armenians. The, I'm talking about, say, from the early 1900s until, say, 1923-24. The Armenians claim about one, one, one to one and a half million. The, the, the Assyrians claim 750,000. For us, it can be anywhere from from a million to 1.3. So probably between three, three to four million people uh, lost their lives. But again, we need to be careful with the demographics because because the the the, the Ottoman government, in their census, tended to understate that the numbers of Christians that, that live within the boundaries of this empire. But on the other hand, the patriarch, the, the Greek patriarch, increased the figures. So, so maybe, maybe there's a middle line somewhere in all this. You know, you know, you know, statistics can be very rubbery, as they say. The abuse and use of statistics. I, I hope I've answered your question. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, Terry. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing the history. Uh, uh, because you know, this is my first time getting to know about you know, the history. Now, I have a question, you know, like, why, you know, the power, you know, want to use genocide, you know, to kill, you know, the group? And also why they focus, you know, on the Christians? Well, good question. Good question. That could be a PhD dissertation <laughs> in itself. How do I answer a question like that? I'll do my best to answer uh, with, the, with what I can... Because, you know, there must be purpose. You know, they need to achieve, you know, something. Okay. See, in 1911, in Salonika, at that time, the city was still under Ottoman rule. It didn't change hands into become Greek in November 1912 during the Balkan Wars. It transferred to Greece, okay? But in 1911, the young Turks, who were the government of the Ottoman Empire, had a secret meeting... And it's also, the strange thing is, it's recorded in the London Times. They give a, a reasonably good outline of, of the meeting. And basically, if you just condense all the stuff that it says, Turkey for the Turks. If, uh, you know, if the Christians want to become Muslims, great. If they don't, kick them out. And so, but also, too, is after the Balkan Wars of 1912-13, the, the Turks then started you know, persecuting the, the Greeks of, uh, of Smyrna. They, they, they tried to kick them out and some fled to the nearby islands of like, like Mytilene, for example, because uh, during the Balkan Wars, like, like, like any war, there is a dislocation of, of population. So, so a lot of the Greek villages that were empty, they put Muslims there and vice versa. Uh, yeah, and, and that's the uh, thing, you know. But also, too, is when, when we talk about genocide, whether it's Holocaust, you start off by looking at, not as a human being, the other. The other. 
you know, they're different to us. He, you know, their hairstyle is different to us. They look different to us. You know, his skin colour is brown and mine is white. And, uh, you know, there, there's, there's about seven or eight stages to when we get to this horrible crime, crime against humanity known as uh, genocide or even, you know, Holocaust. So, you know, so some governments... I, I think if you're interested in that... Uh, sorry, your name again? Amy. Amy, if you're interested... Look, for example, in the former Yugoslavia, in more recent times, and also look between the Hutis and the, and the Tutsis in, in Africa during the 1990s. The other, you know, they hate each other. Thanks, Terry. Yeah. If I could add, Terry, a fear. It's a fear. Yes. Um, the Ottoman Empire saw its territories decrease because they were majority Christian and non-Turk in Europe through the Balkan Wars, and they feared that it would happen to the rest of their territory. They also saw, we don't talk about it as much, but the Middle East was also part of the Ottoman Empire. So they saw the Arab parts break off because they were Arab majorities. So it feared that it would disintegrate further. And because of that fear, um, it persecuted, it made it the others. Um, so they can allow that persecution um, and decided to completely eliminate them. Yes, yes, ma'am. Right. Hi, Terry. Thank you for your um, for your talk. It was um, really fascinating and probably one of the best ways I've heard it uh, explained to me. I'm a Greek person, but we come from the Ionian Islands, so um, this history is really fascinating um, for us. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, what you were saying and what um, Lambros opened up with, and that is um, not learning the lessons from the past and not picking up on history. So I'm wondering what can we do as ordinary citizens to pick up from these lessons from the past, to pick up from these learnings and apply it in our everyday lives so we can, in our ordinary capacity, push back on um, some of the behaviours that we are seeing today that is uh, feeding um, racism. I think firstly, uh, the education system is one, one avenue. Teach the young kids that, you know, just because you're brown, yellow, polka dot, zebra striped or whatever, we're all human beings. We all come into the world the same way and we all go out the same way. Unless, of course, you're murdered <laughs> by, by some rascal. That, that's the first thing. So, secondly, it is incumbent on all of us as citizens and say, oh, I don't have an interest in politics like that. Well, we all live in a society and we all interact with each other. And it is incumbent on us as, as voters to tell our elected the officials that, that the lessons of the past need to be heeded. And I congratulate the Tasmanian State Legislature for having the fortitude to recognise the Greek, Armenian and Assyrian the genocide. What is holding up yeah, the, the federal parliament here from not doing that? What are they, what are they afraid of? Are they afraid of, of going to Gallipoli? Uh, it's going to, you know, offend the, the Turks? Well, I'll say this again. Uh, what, what's the expression? The, the truth shall set you free. You know, the whole thing, look, the, the Turks are not stupid. They're very good diplomats. They know how to play one group off against the other. They're masters of that. But the only reason why I believe they're holding up not recognising that the genocides of the past, because it has to do with the issue of reparations. Because once they say, we've done it, from, from my contacts with the Armenians, the Armenians are ready to hit them with a huge bill to pay up. As but, they should. But, but the thing is, that's not going to be easy. Because also, too, uh, I was reading a, uh, a, an article some years back. The, 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 the US base at Inchilik in southeastern Turkey, the Armenians actually claim that that is Armenian land. So if, if, if Turkey recognises it, 
you know, you know, who knows what, what will happen from there. I mean, I, I, I've told even Turkish friends of mine, I said, if Germany can acknowledge the Holocaust, what makes Turkey such not to do so? What are you afraid of? Because if you recognise it, it will open up the door for, for peace between people, you know. Yeah, we must forgive, but not forget. And, and if we can forgive the, the Turks for what they did, because I know of Turks who actually are on our side, and they know it happened, but they're afraid to open up their big mouths in, in Turkey now because they fear being jailed or even being killed. For example, what, one, of the, what, one of the leading Turks in the world in recognition of the Armenian genocide is Professor Taner Akçam who fled Turkey, went to Germany, is now teaching at, uh, at UCLA in, in Los Angeles. He's a friend of mine. Uh, another Turk that I know, that, that Mr. Z Zarakulu, who, who had a publishing house in, uh, in, in Istanbul. He published uh, books on the genocide. It was firebomb on numerous occasions. They even put him in jail. In the end, he fled and he's now living in, um, in Sweden. And, and this thing, there are Turkish intellectuals, and these are the sort of people that we should be looking to to work with, because they know the language, they know the mindset of their of their own fellow Turks, and we can work with them. So I hope I've answered your question as best I can. Very comprehensively, thank you. Jeremy, uh, thank you very much for a very thoughtful overview. Um, I must uh, admit. Kumbari and people that I've known that have put ideas and I, I wasn't aware of the full history. Um, just what, on one point, uh, just through general uh, history you said about uh, Kamal, who became Ataturk. I was under the mistaken belief that Ataturk was like a, a saviour for the for the, uh, the, the Turks who, who introduced the secular state and uh, pro, uh, was a progressive person. Now, I didn't know he was well, well, look in look in uh, in 1921, where when the Kamalists had their backs with the Greek army on on the forward move onwards into 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 Anatolia, he basically said, uh, "Give me full powers so I can fight the Greeks, and if I lose, I relinquish power." And, and of course he won. Of course he had assistance from the French and the Italians. Okay. The French and the Italians were our worst enemy. The, the Brits were sort of, they, they played both sides. We were lucky that we had Lloyd George, the, the British Prime Minister, who it was, it was a field filling. He absolutely hated Constantine because, because of his sympathies, the King's sympathies with Germany in World War I. But, but, but in terms of that, he preferred... Constantine say to the uh, to uh, to the turf. In fact, he even said that maybe Mustafa Kemal we should put him into into some kind of uh, carpet bazaar in in the east someplace. You know, it'd be better there for us. You know, words to that effect. But uh, but later on, he, he he actually took on the name of Ataturk, okay. meaning meaning the father of the Turks. Okay. And uh, also too, I know some Greeks here may not like what I'm going to say. But for his people, he was a national hero. But for us, he's a villain. And he modernised Turkey from, from a theocracy, from an from a, from a, from a empire that was backward-looking, brought them screaming into the 20th century, got, got rid of the fairs, they started dressing, you know, women were, were dressing like, like some of the women in here. Under, under Mr Erdogan, he's trying to recreate a new Ottoman Empire via other means, and he's trying to bring in this pan Turan to bring in all the Turks under under the umbrella of, of modern day Turkey. So, hist like I say, history does repeat itself to some extent. Yes. Thank you, Jerry. Any other questions? Yes. Are you able to elaborate on the role of Germany in all this? Well, Germany during World War, uh, during the Greco-Turkish War, 1909, was actually out of the out of the picture. Because, because it had its own internal problems uh, between different extreme militarist groups. 
the paramilitary. And that's when Hitler started to appear on the scene in those days. Germany was very, had great influence in Constantinople from about the 1880s right up until the end of World War I. Uh, in fact, um, the, the Germans had key positions in the Ottoman army and navy and they led some of the Ottoman troops. Now, Mustafa Kemal disliked the Germans. He found them very arrogant. And, and of course, the, the, the one German commander that stands out to uh, like that is uh, Lamont von Sanders, who was in charge of the Ottoman troops at Gallipoli. And he was responsible in 1916-17 trying to remove 